sing that bridge again. There ain't there in your house. I want you to sing it with us. And we're going to declare this over us today. Here we go. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chain freight got the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. But you called me a citizen of heaven.
place uh, God today we thank you for the spirit that is being felt even in people's houses across the triad Lord we know the vision that you gave us for this church is the reason we're called triad fellowship you called us to be a body Lord that would experience the power of revival the spirit of revival across this region and so father we thank you that even today Lord we can truly say that the spirit of the risen Christ is dwelling in houses across this region houses in Burlington houses in Greensboro houses in Archdale high houses Lord in High Point houses God in Ashboro houses across this region Lord are being impacted by the Spirit of God and we give you praise for that today and we just come to say thank you Lord Jesus thank you that you died on a cross thank you that you rose from the dead that we might have a life that we might not be succumbed to the power of death as a final power as a final say so but that we might have life through you so Holy Spirit we pray for the next few moments that you would touch us as we read your scriptures as we hear from you and what you would say to us today Lord and we'll give you praise for that as you're still in the spirit of worship I want you uh, just to grab your Bibles and turn with me it will be made available for you uh, on the screen but I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 16 Mark chapter 16 the Bible says this beginning in that first verse of Mark 16 when the Sabbath was over Mary Magdalene the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus's body very early on the first day of the week just after sunrise they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb but when they looked up they saw the stone which was very large and had been rolled away and as they entered the tomb they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed don't be alarmed he said you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified but he has risen he is not here see the place where they laid him we've been in a series for the last couple of weeks on mountains and talking about mountain encounters and today we're going to Go to that same uh, series and we're going to be talking about two mountains, but one message. That's what I want to preach this morning on this Easter Sunday to you there in your houses and all who are watching us. Two mountains, one message. Would you pray with me once again that God would speak with us? Father, I'm asking, Lord, that for the next few moments that you would give me the ability to speak what I cannot speak in my own power. That you would give me the ability, Lord, to speak under the anointing of your Holy Spirit. 
Father, I thank you for I know this is what you would have us to preach today. And this is the word of the Lord to people today. So, Father, I just pray that you would speak to us today about what you're trying to get across to us, Lord. And we're going to thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. And everybody said in their home, amen. Two message and or two mountains and one message. As we've been studying over the scriptures over the last few weeks, we have seen that mountains play a special role in Jewish thought. They were places of divine encounter, places where humans encountered the presence of God. And these mountain encounters gave us a message as it relates to us and our personal walk with the Lord. They were places of divine encounter. They were places where human beings encountered the presence of the Lord. And today on this unusual Easter Sunday, it is no different. For God wants to speak a word to you and I today from the mountains that we read about just a moment ago. Jesus, the Son of God, and we read in Mark chapter 16, the very last chapter of the book of Mark. But if you study Jesus throughout the book of Mark, what you'll find is Jesus comes as the Son of God, this great teacher. And he's been in Israel for the last three years, over the over three years period of time. He has been building a coalition of disciples. He's been healing the sick. He's been demonstrating the kingdom of God, God's rule, God's reign. And that the kingdom of God was in their midst. It was there in the middle of them. However, the religious authorities of the day saw Jesus as a threat to their institution. And in line with the plan of God that had been established before the foundations of the world even existed. They prepared to have Jesus killed. So they seized him and brought him before the Roman authorities. And as part of their plan, they brought him before the Roman authorities so that they could sit silence, that they could put an end to this revolutionary who had been invading their country according to their way of thinking. They took Christ. They beat him. They, they beat him with whips. They spat in his face. There was such a disdain and a hatred for Christ. So much so that they called Pilate, the governor of the region, and they offered, uh, they offered him to Pilate and said, will you do something with him? Will you kill him? We want you to kill him. Pilate even gave an opportunity. The Bible says that he brought out Jesus and he brought out a well-known criminal by the name of Barabbas. And he, he told the crowds, he said, which one do you want me to let go? Barabbas or this one called the Christ? And they all began to yell. The crowds began to yell, crucify Christ, crucify him. They, they, they were yelling and they were telling the Roman governor, they were telling Pilate, we want you to kill Christ. But the mockery is not over. The, the Bible says that they take Jesus and they, the soldiers dressed him up in a purple robe because he did say he was the son of God. He was uh, royalty, so they're mocking him because he supposedly proclaimed to be a king, but supposedly proclaimed to be royalty. They took thorns and they contorted them in such a way to create a rustic looking crown and they pressed it into his head because he was a king. At least that's what he said. They struck his head with the reed and they hit him on the head and they hit him on his body all while bowing down in mockery and with ridicule. They whipped him with a device that has been called historically a cat of nine tails. It was a device that had nine straps and at the end of those straps were sharpened pieces of bone or sharpened pieces of rock and every time that the Romans authorities would hit Jesus with it and pull back it would tear off large pieces of flesh off of one's body. They beat Christ. They whipped Christ. They did all of these things. And then after they tortured him, after they put him through the worst torture known to humankind, they took him to a place called Golgotha. They took him to this place outside of the city gate called Golgotha. It was known in the, in the language of the people as the place of the spoil. It was the place of the skull. It was there they killed him using that ancient Roman technique called crucifixion. 
Now, this was no walk in the park because the Romans had perfected crucifixion. It, it had been in existence before Romans ever came to be, but they perfected it as a punishment designed to inflict and designed to maximize the maximum amount of pain and suffering. It wasn't about just killing someone. It was about killing someone in a way that was horrible. It was about killing someone in a way that would cause them to have the maximum amount of pain. Crucifixion was the most disgraceful form of execution. It, it usually was reserved for slaves, for foreigners, for revolutionaries, and for the most vile of criminals. In a typical crucifixion, the victim would be nailed to the crossbar, would be nailed, and the nails would not be driven through the palms like we often think, but would be driven through the wrist as these uh, uh, could not, the palms could not support the body weight. The crossbar would then be, would be raised and placed in an upright post where the victim's heels would often be nailed to the post. The pressure, in fact, it wasn't just the loss of blood or, or all the pain that caused someone to die, but the pressure on the lungs for them having to, their body weighing on their lungs was the ultimate killer, causing the victim often to suffocate and to die. Because of the inability to breathe. It was at Golgotha that Christ died. Now not much is known in scripture about Golgotha. Although we do know that according to scripture the name Golgotha means the place of the soil. But as scholars have studied the history and the topography of in ancient Israel. They have asserted that Golgotha was a little no. That's a small hill or a small mountain and it was rounded looked like a bare skull often th that gives people the assumption why they think it was called the place of the skull it was a rounded hill a rounded mountain on the outside of Israel the gates of Israel and it was on this mountain that Christ died it was on this mountain on this hill that Christ gave his life it was on this mountain on this hill that Christ took on pain and took on death for you and I because in fact if we'll be honest with ourselves we are the ones who deserve to be on the cross. Uh, we were that Barabbas figure. We were the one that should have died but in, we were the one who deserved to be killed because of all the sin we have committed because of all that we've done with all the failures in our life we deserve that death but aren't you glad to know on this Easter Sunday that Christ took our place just as Christ took a death that Barabbas Abbas deserved. Christ took a death that you and I deserve. He went to a hill. The songwriter would say, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. It's because of that hill. It's because of that mountain that Christ died on that we can have a life today. It was something that we deserve, but Christ took our place. Christ took our place. My friend, yes, he died. His disciples took him off the cross. They, they, they prepared his body for burial. One of his followers was a, was a man who was a Jewish authority. His name was Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph had actually just had a tomb that had just been cut out of rock. It was his personal tomb. It was a place that he gave to Christ so that his master and his teacher could have a proper burial place. And the Bible says in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27 verse 60 that this tomb was a new tomb. It had just been cut or hewn out of the rock. And individuals, if you'll study the history of ancient Israel, what you'll find is individuals with uh, some money who were affluent, who had the resources and other in ancient Israel and other Middle Eastern territories, uh, they had their tombs cut out of the rock mountains. There were rocky mountains in that area and they would have their tombs cut out of rock mountains. This mountain served as great material for creating a tomb. He gives up this. You can imagine. Imagine how much money it would cost to have a tomb. Everybody else was just uh, buried in, in the field. And, and there was no regulations like there are today. But if you had money, you had your own burial tomb in the side of a mountain. And so Jesus was laid in a tomb in a mountain. And, and it seemed 
like all hope was gone. Oh yeah, to the disciples, uh, they are no doubt wondering what in the world is next. Are we next on the chopping block? The man that we've been walking around for three and a half years with, the man we've been we've been praying with, the man we've been seeing miracles take place with. He has now been crucified, and now we're the next ones up on the chopping block. Uh, no doubt they were worried. So much so that the Roman authorities were even worried that some disciples would come and take Jesus' body uh, and, and they would start a myth that he had risen from the dead uh, and that he was the son of God. So they were so worried that they put guards at the tomb to protect the tomb, to keep the tomb. But the Bible says that early on the first day of the week, uh, on an Easter Sunday, uh, that two little ladies, both named Mary, went to the tomb. They were going to go and and see the body of Jesus and make sure that the burial process uh, was taking place. Uh, and when they get there, the Bible says that the sun had risen. And upon arrival to this mountain tomb, they saw that a large stone had been rolled back. And, and when they enter into the tomb, they see a man who's all dressed in white. He's got his apparel on and he's glistening. He's glowing. And, and they're worried. They're wondering what in the world has happened to Jesus. When that man said, don't be alarmed. I know you're looking for Jesus, but he is not here. He has risen from the dead. And aren't you glad to know today on an Easter Sunday that we don't serve a Savior who is dead. We don't serve a Savior who couldn't overcome death. But we worship one who death could not hold him and the grave could not contain him. That's the one that you and I serve today. That's the one we serve on this Easter Sunday today. And this is what the text reminds us of. It was on a mountain that Christ died called Golgotha, Golgotha and it was in a mountain that Christ rose from the dead it was the mountain that Joseph had his tomb cut out of these two mountains share the heart of the gospel for these mountains give us the opportunity to have the greatest encounter with God that we can possibly have on Golgotha the first mountain Jesus died a death he didn't deserve and in doing so he took took our place and what we deserve because of our disobedience. He took a death that we deserve, a death that we rightly deserve, but don't you just think he died on a cross because according to Colossians chapter 2, by his death he overcame the powers of darkness. That's the foolishness of the gospel. That's the ludicrous nature of the gospel. The ludicrous claim of Christianity because what looked like the defeat of Christ was was actually the defeat of darkness. The Bible says in Colossians 2 that he, when he was being nailed on the cross, he in fact was nailing to that cross the principalities and the powers of darkness. He died on a mountain. And at the tomb, the second mountain, Jesus overcame what we could not he overcame the power of death and he made a way so that you and I could have the promise of freedom and salvation. The reason we're setting up all this and the reason we're singing and the reason we're taking up our time and, and preaching is because the message that we have is not something just to make you a better American or make you a better person, but you are in need of something that you don't have in yourself. And the only way that you can have it is through Christ, his resurrection was the validation, was the verification of the fact that Christ was divine and that Christ's work was truly that. Because when he got up out of the grave, and because he got up out of the grave, I don't have to stay in my sin. Because he got up out of the grave, I don't have to stay in my grave of addiction. Because he got up out of the grave, I don't have to worry about being hopeless. Because he got up out of the grave, death does not have the final word but I have eternal life through Jesus Christ I have eternal life through Jesus Christ for there's a message today there is a word from God there is a heavenly declaration that rings from these two mountains for while they may be two mountains two different mountains there is one same message and that message is this, that God so loved the world 
that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him doesn't have to perish, will not be held uh, by death. Death is not the final say so, but will have everlasting life. Christ died. Christ rose again. And for you watching today, for you that are watching this service, Christ rose again so that you may know what life is truly like. You have not been living unless you have known the fullness that comes in God. And there are some of you who are believers today who have accepted to Christ, but God wants to give you a fresh revelation, a, a fresh vision, a fresh understanding of the cross and of the resurrection so that you will be reminded that you are not just living one week to the next, but you are living with an end goal in mind. You are living with eternal life, with everlasting life, and that life begins in us now because what a God to give his son to die a death that you and I deserve. We don't deserve such a gift but oh what a gift this is this is not just a formal Sunday I know it's easy on a Sunday like today it's easy just to watch and think okay then we're going to go through the norms we're going to sing we're going to listen to a sermon and be it but I want to encourage you even after this is over sit with your family pray with your family talk to them about the resurrection talk to them about the crucifixion Remind each other because we have got to remember that we are not living day to day, week to week, just going through life of those who do not have hope. But we have a hope in Jesus Christ. We have that kind of hope. Stephen, would you come? We have that kind of hope. We have a hope in Christ. We have a hope in him. We have a hope that is everlasting. We have a hope that will never fade away. That's the kind of hope that we have the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 10 verses 9 through 10. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Let me say that again. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And that you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. All you've got to do is call out to him and say, God, I want to know this salvation. Christ, you died for me. You died that I might have life, that I might have it more abundantly. And so, Father, I just ask you to save my soul. I, I ask you to save my soul. Some of you that are watching, whatever whatever medium, every venue, whatever venue you're watching on, you've been walking far from God. You've been far from God. But the way you get back is just simple. Just cry out to Him. And here's what it says. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, you are God. You are Lord. And I believe that you died and rose again. The Bible says you'll be saved. If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, the Bible says salvation belongs to you. It is an issue that you have. It starts in your heart, but you confess it with your mouth. And if you do that, God will save you right where you're at. For some of you, God, that are believers, this is going to be a time of renewal. This is going to be a time of renewal for you. I am just sense in, in the spirit. There was, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Mary at the very beginning of the Gospels, he said, you're going to have a child. And here's what she did. She had such a spirit of innocence. She said, how, Lord? And the angel said, by the power of the Holy Spirit. She had such a level of innocence. She was open to God. And whatever God wanted to do in her life. And I need to speak to some believers today. God wants to restore the spirit of innocence in your life. On this Resurrection Sunday. What better day than on the, res the Sunday we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Some of you, your heart has become hardened. 
Your heart has become hardened, but I hear the Holy Spirit saying he wants to restore the spirit of innocence to you. The spirit of innocence where you come and you can't wait just to be in the presence of God. You can't wait. The story of Christ and his death and his resurrection moves you as it once did. It moves you to a spirit of devotion to God. God wants to restore the spirit of innocence today. Some of you, you're dealing with depression. You're dealing with all sorts of things. But I want to tell you, the one who died, the one who rose again... And is here today can assure you of his love and his grace for you. Christ did not die just so you could go to heaven. He died so that you might have abundant life in the here and now. And so wherever you may be, I'm going to pray for you. And if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, I just want you just to call out to him and say, God, I believe you are Lord. Jesus, I believe you are God. I believe you died and you rose again. Would you come and would you save me? I surrender my life to you. And if you'll pray that, if you'll, if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, the Bible says you are saved. You are a believer. You are part of this thing called Christianity. And so I'm going to pray. And while I'm praying, I want you to pray that. And for some of you who are believers, God wants to restore the spirit of innocence to you. God wants to restore you. Some of you are dealing with all manner of things, but God wants to restore you today. Pray with me right where you are. Father, I thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit that I feel in this place. I thank you, Lord, that you are with us, that you have not abandoned us, that you have not forsaken us, that you have not left us to the side. But God, you are with us. And so, Father, I pray for the next few moments. I pray, Lord, that you would touch those, God, who are listening. Those who don't know you as their Lord and their Savior, would they call out to you, God? Would they reach out to you and say, God, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me, O oh Lord. And I pray that you, O oh God, would touch them. Give them the strength, God, to be able to take that step. In both of these mountains, Golgotha and the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, in both of these mountains, there was an encounter with God. But both of them have the same message, Lord. And that message is this, that you love us so much that you sent your son to die and rise again so that we might have life. Father, for those that are out there today, I pray for a special move of the Holy Spirit to touch them. A special move of the Holy Spirit to overshadow them today. you. I'm going to ask everybody who's in here and even those that are watching I'm going to ask you if you just lift your hands with me. You'll just lift your hands with me. Oh God, we love you. God, we love you. You died a death that we deserve. You that you did not stay there but that you rose again so father i pray in my heart lord i'm gonna, god i'm gonna start with the pastor of this church god i pray you restore my innocence to you and that i would be moved by this lord god that your spirit would move me oh god to see what you have done and give me fresh revelation fresh vision of the fact that you died for me but you rose again Father, I pray, Lord, for everyone who's watching. And I pray that the spirit of the risen Christ would walk among them in their rooms. That the spirit of the risen Christ would walk among them in their houses. Right now, Lord, the spirit of the risen Christ is walking among them, Lord. Just as the risen Christ walked among the disciples later in the Gospels after he had risen from the dead. The spirit of the risen Christ is walking among you today. And in his nail-pierced hands, and in his nail-pierced wrist, he's offering you salvation. He's offering you healing. I just declare now that Christ didn't die on the cross just for you to be saved. But that salvation is holistic. It includes the access to healing. And I just declare healing right now over people who are watching. Healing over your spirit. 
healing over your soul, healing over your mind. Some of you are going through some issues in your mind. You are wrestling in your mind. But I declare that the spirit of the risen Christ walks among you today, healing your mind, healing your body. Lord, I thank you right now that you're healing some people even now, Lord. That healing is being administered to them. Because you died and rose again, you have all power in your hand. For all that you do, Lord, we're going to be thankful. And Lord, we declare we're going to live this week and every other week in light of the fact that you rose again. God, what a way to live a life. That the one who we serve and worship every Sunday sits in heaven's throne at the right hand of the Father there with all power in his hand. He was the one who could say, oh death, where is your sting and oh grave, where is your victory? You have no victory over me. I've got all power in my hand. I've got all authority in my hand. So Father, I pray help us to live as people of the resurrection. People, Lord, who are not totally succumbed to, totally engulfed behind the tragedies and the calamities of our day, but people who are reminded that you sit on the throne. So Father, we praise you on this Easter Sunday, on this Resurrection Sunday. And God, we do give you glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to do. If you accepted Christ as your Lord, I want you to message us on Facebook at Triad Fellowship. Message us on Facebook, on Instagram. Go and message us. We want your name. We want to be able to pray for you. We want to be able to connect with you. If you need special prayer, I want you. I want you to call. We're going to, this number will be up on on the uh, the bottom of this video. Call us at 336-355-1815. We'll lead you to the Lord in prayer. If you've got a special need in your life, we'll pray for you there. We'll pray that God would meet your need, and we'll believe with you. God bless you. We love you as always. Uh, let's end our service just saying our church benediction. Would you say it with us? Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. God bless you. I hope that you've enjoyed service today. The power of the Holy Spirit uh, was definitely in this room as we were praying uh, for you, praying for your needs and praying that you would come to know uh, the realness of Christ and his resurrection. But I do want to give you a couple of announcements that just so you can know what's going on. This Tuesday night at 7 o'clock again, we're going to be having our Bible study. Uh, you don't want to miss this. The God has really been blessing. Uh, it is a great time of studying the scripture. It's a great time of dialogue. And we've been having some awesome dialogue, probably my favorite part of the entire time. And then we have a wonderful time of prayer afterwards. So, so make sure to come 7 o'clock at if we're using Zoom. Uh, this is a great way to engage with your church as we're not able to meet in person. Uh, like, like I said, it's at 7 o'clock. So join us. Go to zoom.us slash join. And there or in your app, you can type in this number, 566-866-198. 566-866-198. Uh, and secondly, as always, thank you so much for giving uh, to the work of ministry and to what God is doing through Triad Fellowship. Makes it possible for us to do all of this. And so if you would like to give today, maybe you're not a part of our church and you would like to donate, uh, you can go to triadfellowship.org slash give. Or if you would prefer uh, to give, you can give uh, in person or through a cash or check. You can send that to P.O. Box 16675 Greensboro, North Carolina, 27416. As always, it's great to worship with you, even virtually, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. God bless.